This episode of Real Engineering is brought to you by Skillshare, home to over 20,000 classes that could teach you a new life skill. As World War II drew to a close and the race to Berlin reached its finale, two Soviet armies converged on the Third Reich capital. Marshal Georgi Zhukov from the north and Marshal Ivan Konev from the south, motivated to beat the Americans and British to claim Nazi technology and plunder for themselves. The battle for Berlin raged for 17 days as the Soviet forces surrounded the city, but the Nazi surrender may have come sooner if not for one of the largest defensive structures ever built. As the 150th and 171st Soviet rifle divisions began advancing across the Spree River, they met the Zoo Tower, located within the Berlin Zoo, a behemoth structure built as a center for anti-aircraft operations, equipped with four 12.8cm Flak 40 anti-aircraft guns, together capable of firing 96 rounds per minute and with a group of 20mm and 37mm anti-aircraft guns on the lower platforms, the Zoo Tower was a veritable death castle. A death castle with no glaring design flaw to lead to its destruction. Any aircraft that dared enter its 10 km range was likely to meet its end, but on this day the Zoo Tower turned its attention to the ground and the approaching Soviet army and began unleashing powerful and accurate fire, reducing their tanks to smouldering scraps of metal in short time and halting their progress. The Soviets ordered the tower to be shelled at range from their most powerful 203mm howitzer, a purpose-built bunker buster, but the 100kg rounds had little effect. With 2.5m thick steel reinforced concrete walls, the tower was practically immune to shell damage. Even if a hole could be punched through with repeated shots, the tower would remain standing. With no single load-bearing structure, it would take an immense explosion to take down these towers. The Soviets instead decided it was best to circle around the tower outside its effective range and later negotiate a surrender. The Zoo Tower was the first of many anti-aircraft towers built throughout Nazi cities. Berlin had three pairs of towers forming a defensive triangle around the city center and central government. The first pair in Berlin Zoo, the next in Friedrichshain and the third in Humboldtheim. Two more pairs were constructed to protect the vital port of Hamburg, and finally, three more pairs were constructed in Vienna, Austria to form another defensive triangle around the city centre. Amazingly, many of these towers remain intact despite numerous efforts to destroy them. Stark reminders for the inhabitants of these cities of an evil war waged by their ancestors. The towers were ordered to be built by Hitler after the devastating and merciless bombing raids of civilian targets in Berlin in 1940 by the British RAF. Furious Hitler demanded top priority for the project, ordering railway and shipping traffic to be diverted to satisfy the 1,600 tons of material needed for every day of construction. With the help of forced labour, the Zoo Tower was completed in just six months and used a total of 78,000 tons of gravel, 35,000 tons of cement and 9,200 tons of steel, along with the immense amount of wood required for the moulds that formed the shape of the towers. To this day you can still see the outlines of the planks that formed these moulds. Each tower complex consisted of a tower pair, an attack tower named the G Tower and a communications tower called the L Tower. All communication towers took this rectangular shape and came equipped with radio equipment, spotlights and their own anti-aircraft guns and were tasked with coordinating the attack. The attack towers came in a variety of shapes, with the earlier generation fortresses taking this square form 42 meters high and 57 meters wide with turrets on each corner. Later in the war, as supplies became more scarce, the designs took the form of these 16-sided circular structures, 50.6 meters high and 43 meters in diameter, like this one in Augarten Park in Vienna. The attack towers were capable of firing 8,000 rounds per minute. They formed a formidable air defense within their effective range, but in reality, these towers had an extremely unimpressive track record with downing planes. Instead, they acted primarily as a deterrent. Any bomber that dared stray into their sights would be more than likely shot down, but instead they mostly just kept away from these stationary positions. Each complex had an effective range of about 10 kilometers, so the towers formed an important defense for the strategic positions they covered, but left much of their cities unprotected. But these towers were much more than just flak towers, they served as valuable shelters for the civilian populations. Each tower had its own freshwater well and vast stores of food. The towers had their own power generators with underground supply lines for fuel and of course massive stores of ammunition. The towers even contained hospitals with one tower containing a maternity ward where many Berliners were born during air raids. Up to 15,000 civilians could take refuge from the relentless bombing. 
In the final days of the war, up to three times that number are reported to have crammed themselves into these concrete shells, leading to horrifying conditions with people dying in the cramped corridors with nowhere to bury them, toilets overflowing and the hospitals overflowing with injured and dead patients. There are few visible signs of the devastation these cities endured during the Second World War. Thanks to the funding of the Marshall Plan, cities were rebuilt brick by brick, removing the scars of the past, but these buildings remain, a testament to the strength of their construction. All valuable materials have been stripped away from them and multiple attempts have been made to destroy them, but with the proximity of the surrounding city and the thick concrete walls, the demolition has proven too costly and difficult to undertake. Of the six towers in Berlin, only one remains mostly intact. The Zoo Tower was destroyed by British engineers, but it didn't go down without a fight. On the first attempt, the engineers packed it with 25 tons of dynamite. When the dust cleared, the tower remained standing. The tower finally collapsed on the third attempt with 35 tons of dynamite, and from there the rubble was broken up and transported away, and the land handed over to the Berlin Zoo, where the Hippopotamus Park now resides. Both of Hamburg's attack towers remain, with one being transformed into a nightclub and the other now acting as a giant energy storage facility. The thick concrete walls provide fantastic insulation, allowing for the inside to be filled with 2 million litres of water, which is heated with biomethane and wood chip burners, solar panels on the roof and waste heat from a nearby factory, providing heating for 3,000 homes and electricity for 1,000. All of Vienna's towers remain, but only one has been fully repurposed as an aquarium, once again taking advantage of the thermal stability of the interior for climate control of the tanks, while the walls of the aquarium have been repurposed as a climbing wall. The attack tower in Arenberg Park has been used as a storehouse for artwork too. This attack tower in Augarten Park had one attempted demolition, but it only managed to crack the roof and collapse one of the balconies, and as a result the tower has been reinforced with steel wire to protect the public from a possible collapse. Today these towers remain as a gargantuan reminder of a terrible war, but have been accepted and assimilated into the urban landscape. Parks have formed around them, zoos around and inside them, and have even been repurposed to help towards a more sustainable future. You may have admired some of the shots in this video, and I recorded all of the footage you saw of the Austrian flak towers myself while on a road trip through Germany and Austria, which you can follow by watching my new vlog series where I visit present day locations from World War II to teach you about their history. I'm the type of person that never reads instructions, I'd much rather dive in and learn through trial and error, and that has led to some hilarious shortcomings with my drone cinematography. I only just recently discovered that I can adjust the pitch and exposure of the drone's camera in flight with small dials at the back. Had I actually gone to the bother of watching a few tutorials like this drone videography course in Skillshare, I would have learned this lesson far sooner. These days you can teach yourself pretty much any skill online and Skillshare is a fantastic place to do it. With professional and understandable classes that follow a clear learning curve, you can dive in and start learning how to do the work you love. A premium membership begins around $10 a month for unlimited access to all courses, but the first 1000 people that sign up with this link will get the first 2 months for free. So ask yourself right now, what skill have you been putting off learning? What project have you been dreaming of completing but you aren't sure if you have the skills to do it? Why not start right now and sign up to Skillshare using the link below to get your first 2 months for free. You have nothing to lose and a valuable life skill to gain. As usual, thanks for watching and thank you to all my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to see more from me, the links to my Twitter, Facebook, Discord server, subreddit and Instagram pages are below.